Do you feel that in a time when we are more connected than ever, we are drifting away from real human connections, especially to ourselves? I do. Hi, I'm Leticia Latino, and I want to invite you to join me and my very inspiring guests in exploring ways to reconnect to your essence, to your definite purpose, to what makes you tick. Are you ready? Hello all. I hope everybody is doing good and welcome to Back to Basics. I'm excited about my guest today. She's a 20-year veteran in the television business, an Emmy recipient, the founder and owner of Client Creative Media, and one of my co-authors and Pink Shoe Sisters in what it is now an Amazon bestseller, our book, Women in Business Leading the Way. Hello, Marcy Klein. Hello, Leticia. How are you today? Good. So happy to have you here. Oh, I'm super happy to be here. I've been excited waiting for this time. <laughs> well, I'm very, very excited. And you know, we are, people know we've been doing the, the Pink Shoe series already when we've had a few of our co-authors in the podcast. And I think now people are starting to probably perceive what an amazing group of, of friends and sisters and co-authors we have created out of this book. So I'm very happy that you're here. Yeah, me too. I know it is an am it's amazing how we all sort of bonded together and created a sisterhood out of just something that was a business opportunity for us. And we created it into a, a sisterhood, which is much more meaningful now. Absolutely. And, and, and actually, you're my first interview after our book now has been officially published and it's a number one Amazon <laughs> bestseller. So that's something that I, I know we're all very happy about. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's something that you can never take back. Like, wow. You know, I know the idea of saying that, right? Like, wow, I'm an, I'm an author. I'm a best-selling author and you're a best-selling author. It's like, it's kind of crazy in a great way to be able to share that and be able to feel, you know, have that um, as an accomplishment. And, you know, I always <laughs> tell you this, and you're an Emmy winner. So <laughs> <laughs> the well, list keeps true. growing on and on. <laughs> well, that, it's funny. It's I forget. The Emmy was a while ago, so I forget. This is like the newest. Anytime I accomplish something new, I sort of forget about the old thing that I accomplished. You know, you get, I'm one of those people that I just I'm so goal oriented that I, you know, I really wanted to be an author, like something that I'd always dreamed about. And then all of a sudden, it, last week, it became a reality. So it's I'm really just riding on that high and forgetting about everything else, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't let you forget you because I'm I'm usually being very impressed. But you're right. Actually, you know that my first copy, I have the book. I read your chapter for the first time from the book because everybody else I'm interviewing for the book, I, I've read them uh, online. Uh -huh. And I even thought about autographing it to myself or dedicating <laughs> it to myself because, you know, it's like, as you said, it, this is something I also been wanting to do for a, for a while. Uh -huh. and, and it should be a reminder, like to have it there that anything you dream can become true. Yeah. And how did you, when you first got, when you, I'm sorry, I'm switching the tables on you and asking you a question. No, how that's did okay. You, <laughs> <laughs> I love how it. Did you, how did you feel when you first, when, when we, when Tara wrote, Tara's our publisher, by the way, when Tara wrote to you and said, uh, we made, we made it, we made it to number one on the Amazon charts. How did you feel? Oh, it was, it was, this is a reality as, you know, we've been working hard for it and, and done the, I guess, all the hard work of writing it and doing, you know, some appearances. But then when it's, it's really when you, you get the prize, when you get the medal uh, at the end of the race. So it's, it's exciting, but I'm even excited about starting to talk about it with other people like we're doing today with you here uh, yeah. because there's a lot of knowledge in, in your chapter. Yeah, well, talk, talk to me. Ask, ask me what you want to ask me. And I'm Abs happy to share. Absolutely. <laughs> and I know and I've told the audience that any episode, any episode that we'll do on my Pink Shoe Sisters and the book is going to be different be to the normal dynamics. But by now, they they see you asking me questions. Now they know why. Like, we cannot have the, <laughs> the usual format in the podcast. But, you know, let me start saying that that I loved how you tackled your chapter. And of course, I'm not going to give a lot away because I want everybody listening to to buy the book and read it and, and the link will be on the notes. But basically, one of the things that you love the most in life to do, what is it? 
surfing. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I knew that since I met you. And so when I started reading and I, and you know, I read the title Riding the Wave of Entrepreneurship, of course, it sounds great, but you know, it's like, it's also a little bit like, okay, riding the wave. And then I realized you decided to write your own chapter, making a comparison between surfing and entrepreneurship. And that's brilliant. Well, I really thought it was the best way for me to kind of tell my story and keep it and keep it, um, I don't know, kind of relevant to me and also keep a good structure because otherwise I'm a very, I'm all over the place and I can go from here to there and everywhere. I <laughs> and if love I just, it. So if I just kind of use the, the metaphor of the ocean, it really helped me stay, stay focused and centered on what really is important to me. That's fantastic. And, and of course, uh, we'll go a little bit to, into, you know, what, what you made out of your life and what you study, because that's a passion. And, and I always have to ask about that. But the one thing that hit me on your first page in your chapter is when the first time you went surfer, you used surfing, you said, I had butterflies in my stomach because even though I love the beach, I never lost the fear of the waves having been held under as a child. Yes. And that's powerful because... First of all, I always ask what gives you butterflies and what makes you tick. So let me let me fast forward <laughs> to normally the last uh, question. But obviously, surfing, you know, makes you tick. But you were doing something that you weren't feeling too comfortable with. Oh, you mean? Oh, that's true. Um, I mean, I remember the first time that my, my parents took me to the beach. I think I was like, you know, maybe I was like 11 years old. I wasn't that young or the first time that I remember. And I remember going into the waves and being held under and being turned upside down and not being able to find my way back up. And maybe it was two or three seconds, but in my mind, you know, at, at that little, at that young age, it was an eternity. And I really thought that that was the end for me at that young age. You know, mm, I was so scared. Course. And so getting back in the water, it was always something that was, it was so scary to me. And I just never felt comfortable at the, you know, at the beginning. And, but of course, now that I've been surfing for maybe 34 years now, I don't have that same fear, but I'll tell you, I did when I first started, when I was 18, when someone started, when someone took me down to, um, I went to Black's Beach. I, well, well, let me back you up a little bit. I went to, I, I went to school at UC San Diego mm -hmm. and I actually, believe it or not, I was a tennis player. Okay. Was, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't really share that with you. I forgot to tell you that. Yeah. Um, I'm, I was a, um, actually, I was a number one in Long Beach in, in doubles for my division at, at my school. Oh, wow. And so, yeah. So we went to, we went to city and we gave, we became number one in doubles and that was a really exciting time. And I loved tennis, but I played it all my life since I was a little girl. And then, so, but when I went to college, I decided not to sign up, like sign on for the tennis team or try out. I just wanted to kind of just do something different. I think I had reached burnout, you know, mm -hmm. even though it was a great sport. And so, um, and your parents to, were good with that. Um, yes, because I think that they knew that I, that I was one of those kids that wasn't gonna, wasn't very controllable. <laughs> okay. No. And I asked that because normally I understand a little bit more of the family dynamics, but we're doing something different, but that's good that they let you, you know, make your choices because there are parents, you know, that I know that will never having the, the talent that you're describing that they will never let their child not go for a scholarship or something like that. You know, that's so true. And it's really funny later on in my life. And I, now that I do, I'm a video production, um, video, I do video production. I did a, what do you call it? A, a pilot project for the tennis channel called Tiger Moms. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, I'm sorry, called Court Kids, which is about Tiger Moms for tennis and how these parents are just so crazy about making sure that their kids, you know, really reach success in tennis. So I know what you're talking about. It's but crazy. Luckily, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But my parents luckily were not tiger parents. They um, allowed me to do what I wanted to do. They, they also knew that they probably couldn't control me because I, after I was 18, I mean, they kind of could with finances, of course they could, you know, kind of guide me and, you know, by limiting what they were to give me. But at the same time, I always had a strong personality and actually everyone in my family has a strong personality. So I think we were, it comes, it, we, it comes out with the babies. We, we came out with very, very strong, all type A personalities in my well, family. But uh, <laughs> there has to be something around that, a correlation between that and being successful. I'm always very inclined to have that because when I interview people, I have to say that 
people with that kind of personality that they know what they want, they go for it, they kind of stay in the ground a little bit. They, for whatever reason, they achieve what they're looking for. And in fact, in your book, in your chapter, I don't know if I wrote it on my chapter, but this is something like that when everybody says you cannot do this, oh my God, that's like such a trigger for me. And you wrote <laughs> the same thing. Isn't that so true? I, yeah, I said, if you, yeah, yeah, prove me wrong or I, I'm going to show you that I can. You tell me no, I'm going to tell you that I can. Oh, I'll yeah. Figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so but it's the same with that. You want to pro- <laughs> prove them wrong. So to me, that's a great driver. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you um, went to school and you, you, but you're from California, right? Yeah, I'm from California. So I grew up here. I mean, I did grow up um, hanging out on the beach with my friends, you know, even as a teenager, but m- mostly just like hanging out and just, you know, you know, how, like kids hang out on the beach as teenagers. You do, It's not about the water. It's about being in a little group and hanging out and chatting with your friends. No, absolutely. So, but the surfing kind of, I, I can now visualize, okay, she's a full-blown California girl and, 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 and <laughs> she loves to surf. And then when you went, did you know about your passion about, you know, media and TV early on? Is this something that gave you butterfly as well, or you kind of got into it just by default? Well, the, the funny thing is, so I went to school and, and, and I discovered surfing within like the first couple weeks of being at UC San Diego because I'm a tomboy, you know, it's a tennis player and all that. And, I mean, I can keep up with the boys, you know, as a champion tennis player. So I always wanted to be where the boys were and the boys weren't playing tennis. They were surfing. So some of my friends, some like my guy friends invited me to go with them and they took me to Black's Beach with a, I went down with a soft foam board and went down to the beach and with with the boys and learned how to surf and it was amazing the first experience was absolutely phenomenally amazing i was like it was like a drug to me i knew i had to just do it all the time and get better and better and and just get more confident and then so i went into school undeclared i went in as an and in my school you have to declare your major after your second year so when my second year came and i had to declare my major i looked down the syllabus to find the course, I mean, the, the major that had the least amount of coursework so I could spend the most amount of time on the beach. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, that's a good strategy. <laughs> I know, right? So it was just really a lazy man's um, strategy or sort of a beach lover strategy because I was so in love with the ocean at that point, and I still am. And then it turns out that, that the major that I chose was communications. And to get into communications, you had to take this class called VA70 that taught you how to operate the camera and how television works. I literally just had to take that class to get into the major. And when I got took the class, I fell immediately deeply in love with that subject. I just loved everything about it. I wanted to be like the cameraman. I wanted to be the director. I wanted to be the star of the movie. So <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, you, you, yeah. you have to take every perspective. That's important in being successful too. Yeah. Well, I was just, I was just like a little spoiled brat is what I think, but (laughs) 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 wanting what I wanted. (laughs) And (laughs) and so you pursue it, you fell in love and then you say, okay, this is what I want to do. Yeah. And then it turned out that I actually had an aptitude for it. And I ended up being the, most of my, my courses, you had a choice to turn in, you could make a radio podcast, a radio, they didn't have podcasts on them. You could make a radio cast or you could make a video or you could do a um, you know, a presentation with art, or you can do a oral oral presentation. And every class, I always chose to make a video. And so I basically spent like the the two, the last two years of my college running around making videos, and so much so that I actually got noticed by um, another woman who was an older woman who was going back to school as an older person. She was actually married, and her husband had a video production company, and she sought me out to work as a production assistant on some of their productions. So while I was still in college, I start, I became a production assistant and getting paid to work in video. And it was really great training because I learned from the bottom, like literally like getting people's coffee and running back and forth to the store and picking up props. And um, I mean, the whole set has to, you, you, don't, you don't realize that every single person in a video production is as important as the person at the top because the person who's going in the car to run for the water bottles whatever that you need, the show has to stop. The production stops until that person returns. So every person has a key role in production and you learn to appreciate and not to be 
what's the word? When you get to the top, you appreciate everybody, everybody's position, and you're not. Um, I guess I don't know. It's I don't know what the word is. I don't know what you're not, but I know you. Yeah, appreciate. like you minimize that job or that role, or you don't consider yes. it's important. Yes, exactly. I do not minimize any anyone's position, even though even the intern who's not getting paid is a key part of your production, and and learning that from the ground up was really great, great learning for me. And then after after becoming a production assistant, I actually did a couple of internships. I worked for NBC News in San Diego. It was um, the NBC station down there. And then, mm-hmm. um, and I also had my own show, a cable show called For Delmar Cable TV. So I was really quite busy learning video production while I was still in college. And, it, and I just... I just loved it. Everything about it. I, and I still love it. Today. That's so cool. And I've seen yeah. you in action. So I know that that's true. But it was there a moment where you say, oh, my God, like, oh, I'm here. Or, I, you know, like when you were in those young years, I, I imagine when you go into a studio like at NBC or something like that, you say, oh, boy, I, I'm making it. Oh, yeah. I remember my very first job when I, I I got a job on at Laura Mars. The, the way I got my first job, my first real job after I graduated, this was pretty funny. My older sister is a CPA. Okay, mm-hmm. nothing to do with the television production, but she happened to be a CPA in Westwood, California, which is you know right in the heart of everything. And I'm like this beach girl from Del Mar now, right? Because I'm like from San Diego area. And but I called, and I didn't know really. I knew a few people in the LA area, but I knew you had to go to LA to sorry, to Hollywood or to LA in order to work in the video business and the TV business. So I asked my sister, I said, do you know anybody, does anybody in your accounting firm know anybody in the video business? So they, my sister's co-CPA introduced or gave her the name of a guy named Tom Tenenbaum. Now, Tom Tenenbaum was the president of Viacom. I'm sure you've heard wow. of Viacom, right? Of course. <laughs> and I'm not in their business, but yeah. <laughs> so little Marcy Klein, you know, just fresh out of college, I get a meeting. He somehow takes a meeting with me because my sister's friend, my sister's co-CPA asked him for a meeting and he took it with me. So I come mm-hmm. to the office not knowing. And he asked me what I want to do. You know, he's sitting at this giant desk. He's a very powerful man. I mean, he owns Viacom. Mm-hmm. And, and wow. he asked, asked me what I want to do. I bring my resume and I'm, you know, trying to be, I really don't know what the heck I'm doing. He says, oh, you want to work in TV? Okay. He gets on the phone, makes a phone call. At that point in time, he had a show called Jake and the Fat Man and Matt mm-hmm. Locks. And they were at a studio called Lorimar Studios, which now is, I think, Sony Studios. It's changed. Okay. But it's, <laughs> so he makes a phone call and said, and and unbeknownst, unbeknownst to me how powerful, how the industry really works, one phone call, next thing I know, I have a meeting at, on the, the new TV show, I mean, on the TV show, Jake and the Fat Man. And so I go in for an interview and they immediately hire me that exact day because I came from recommended from Tom Tenenbaum. The, yeah. The power of his name. And they, everybody thought I was kind of untouchable. So when I made a mistake or did anything <laughs> wrong, they thought I, I love it. <laughs> he thought I was Tom Tenenbaum's girl. Really, he barely knew me from anybody. He just did a favor and made a phone call, which was phenomenal. <laughs> but you were also prepared for it. That's what I say. I always say connections are really so important and a lot of people minimize them. You know, we know we need to know people, but you know, when you have a good connection, one that's willing to pick up that phone and, and, and go, you know, the extra mile to play someone that it's also talented. You had studied for it. You you had also all the the requisites, I'm sure. I did. And, I did. And so it's <laughs> like when when they say when luck, I, there's a saying, and I, I don't, I'm not going to be able to repeat it, but it's like uh, uh, that you have to have luck, but you also have to prepare to when the luck arrives. Yes, that's true. You're so right. And there is a saying, and I can't remember. It's like when opportunity meets luck or something like that. Or when Exactly. So we're thinking about the same thing. But it sounds yeah. to me like that's what happened. And of course, you were passionate. You were good at what you did. And uh, I mean, I definitely want to hear more about what you're doing now. But basically, you started a very successful career in television. Yeah. Um, I started as a production assistant and worked my way up from production assistant to production coordinator, which is huge because right now, knowing how to coordinate is a huge part of business. So that was the aspect where that, that was the main part of TV that, that correlates over to business. So um, production assistant, production coordinator, um, associate producer, um, segment producer, 
field director, and then supervising producer and senior producer is kind of the path that I took. But all the time after I became, after my experience as a production coordinator, everything above that was all about going out in the field and telling stories and interviewing people and shooting visuals of them in action to tell their story. So I started right after I graduated to that next level of, um, you know, segment producer. That's when I started telling people stories. And that was in my early 20s. And, mm-hmm. and then actually, um, after that, my biggest break, I think, came from I was working on a show called Trial Watch, which was a kind of like it's kind of like an inside edition type story, but it was all about trials. And one of the stories that I did was about this guy who was suing the city because he had just painted his house, just painted it, and brand new, beautiful, wet paint. And the city was driving by with letting out med flies. You know, the, mm. the, I don't know if you remember that, where they would, they would let yes. out these flies because to eat, because there was a problem with aphids or some bugs or something. Anyway, the guy's, the, the guy's house is just speckled with all these little spots of black bugs all over the house. And, wow. and yes, it's a real problem, but I saw the humor in it. And so I sort of made the, the story into a comedy story, which mm-hmm. grabbed the attention of a new TV show that Greg Kinnear was starring in called um, The Best of the Worst. And, and so I ended up getting um, an interview on that new show called The Best of the Worst. And that show was a, a DGA show, Directors Guild of America. And so what happened is I interviewed for the show and they, they liked my sense of humor and they liked the story. That was my, and it was a, supposed to be a funny show. And so they ended up hiring me, but in order to hire me, they had to it, put me into the Directors Guild of America because it was a DGA signatory show. And that kind of changed the course for me in a lot of ways because I got into the Directors Guild, which is a highly sought after union to be in, in mm-hmm. if, if, you're a, if you're in the television business. So at eight, in 1990, I became a director in the Directors Guild of America. And I've been wow. in, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, and I got and Greg Kinnear was like the first real talent that I directed. Although you can say like, and Greg will probably laugh and say, "Oh yeah, you Mar- you didn't direct me, Marcy. I directed you." <laughs> 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 and it's probably true because I really didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a, what do you say in the it's a collaboration. <laughs> it's in the spirit. <laughs> but he, he taught me a lot. Greg taught me a lot, and. Um, Oh, I, w- I was actually married back then, and um, I thought I had such a crush on Greg. Oh, he was so cute. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes nice. it even even more fun. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's that's awesome. But so you 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 know you did your career, and you were you were in very successful shows and all that. But I'm sure you know at the point where you started your own family and you became a mom. And I'm fast forwarding here, but uh, yes. you, you talk you talk in the book about balance being key and, and, and work life balance is one of the questions we get asked the most. I know, in, right. in, you know, when we get interviewed for this book and I know you always have a great answer for it. So what do you want to share in terms of how that whole episode, because that also changed the trajectory of your life into what eventually became your own company? Yes. Well, it's, it's interesting. I, I decided just to stay home. I, I was trying to balance work and I mean working in television and being a mom and I was at that point in time I was working on the Dr. Phil show and I just found it overwhelming I found like that my kids I my baby was at home with the nanny and I was at, at working and I had one on the way and I was working crazy long hours and I thought what am I doing this doesn't make any sense I, why did I become a parent if I'll never see my children so I decided to go cold turkey and stay home and be a mom and at first it was it was it was hard. I'll be honest with you. I really think <laughs> in actuality, when I had two little ones in diapers, when they like, until they were both about five or six years old, I almost think, I think it was way harder to be a stay at home mom than to direct a set of 30 people, to be honest with you. <laughs> I believe it. I think that a lot of moms, we don't want to quit because we know that, 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 you know, it's, it's a lot of work. But one quick question though, yeah. was your situation at that time, like your husband did say, well, yeah, stay at home. Did you have the support? Because I find that a lot of women, they, they, although they could economically stop working, they kind of convince themselves that they can't and that's why they don't quit because you said a lot of my salary was going to the nanny anyway. So you made that reflection. Yeah, well, um, my husband, did, he, he was supportive of me staying home at first and he definitely was supportive and he was fine with that and it kind of gave him a chance to be, 
you know, to be the man because I'm so darn strong. You know, I'm always, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think in a lot of ways he liked that I was staying home. And he, he also knew that, you know, he also could travel. He his job, he's in sales. So he travels. And with me being gone on TV and him being gone on sales, it just was not really working. So we kind of realized it was smarter for me mm-hmm. to stay home. And, um, and it was an, a big adjustment. And I, actually, it, it, I'll be honest, like it, there was times when it was very troubling. It was very hard because I, I, I was not used to being the, 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 where the buck stopped with me. I was used to being, you know, dr- have, having so many other people to count on where I could delegate work or delegate things. And so now it was just me at home. And I don't know if, if I was the best mom on the planet, but I, I mean, I love my kids to death and I took them to the farmer's market and we went to the park and we did all kinds of amazing, great things. And I got to spend tons of great time with them, but it was, I felt overwhelmed as a, as a mom of two, to be honest, I felt very no, overwhelmed. I, and that's why I wanted to dig into, because I know a lot of people have these same thoughts and, and you quit actually pretty much on a very high note, you know, you're working on the Dr. Fields TV show. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of people, you know, because some People say, well, I'm not doing that good on my job or I'm going to get laid off or whatever. And then it's almost like, OK, this is the best thing to do. But you, you really quit when when you were winning at the casino, pretty much. And that, <laughs> not too many people do that. Yeah. You know what? That was actually really that was interesting because I, I did I did feel like I could go a lot farther. And I felt like and I know today that if I would have stayed in that lane, I would be a lot of my friends are like running, running studios and, you know, high executives and, you know, so I have all these friends in high places and I know if I would have stayed, I could have been that person too. But I do feel like I made the right choice for me because I feel like life for me is the living and, and, and being with my children and knowing who they are and having such a close relationship is so much more important to me. And it changed who I am because I do feel like I was something about the the television industry even though it's fun and exciting and it you know it, it and and it's a lot of work but it's, it's something about it makes you hardened you have to be hard and tough to be in that industry in my in my from my from my point of view and be, staying home and becoming a mom made me look at life differently and look at love and think wow you know what i made the right decision because i could i could be I would, you kind of like miss something. There's something that I would have missed, like that I, my eyes were open to it once I stay, became a stay-at-home mom. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I love it. And uh, I, I always say that too, I work, as you know, for the family business and, and certain times I see also my peers that, you know, because when it's the family business, it's like, you don't get promotions, you don't get all these <laughs> other <laughs> recognitions. And sometimes I admit it, you miss it. You miss that part of the corporate, you know, environment. But I always tell people, but as you yourself have said that, that on Fridays, you decide to go surfing. <laughs> right, right. Right. If you can. And that's one of the perks. I've had so many perks that I'm my own boss and I'm not going to get uh, fired if I wanted to stay home or if one of my child is, is sick. So I kind of, although I, I didn't take that break and I've worked, but I work at my own pace, which is very different than being like in the scenario that you were in or that other moms find in where they are really in 16, 18 hour a week jobs. A yeah. day. Yeah. I mean, def- definitely it's, um, it's, it's amazing that to have your own choices and you don't have those, you don't have those in, um, when you work for somebody else. Absolutely. And so in the book, uh, you kind of then, you know, you created your own media production company. Uh huh. And, uh, well, I'm going to let you share with us whatever you want, but okay. uh, I know that, that you've shared some great insights of the ups and downs and, and the benefits and, and what you've enjoyed about, uh, really driving the bus and, and deciding what you want to achieve. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. You know, um, I started Klein Creative Media. The reason I started Klein Creative Media, it's just funny. It was, remember I was telling you earlier about that tennis show that I did? Yeah. Um, back in 2013, I was still a stay-at-home mom, mostly. And I was just kind of dabbling a little bit to, to keep my creative side going. I did this thing called um, heirloom videos where I was like doing living legacy videos I was doing mm-hmm. that from home, mostly mostly being a mom, but doing videos from home. And then I got the idea to do that thing I told you about called um, Court Kids, which was Tiger Moms for Tennis. 
You and know? I, the reason I, so I decided to do that pilot just because I just had this idea. It just came to me. And, you know, the kids were at home with the nanny. And I still, you know, I still got the nanny a couple days a week and I could go out and do creative things. So I went out with my camera and started creating this pilot. And the pilot ended up, the Tennis Channel was interested in it. It came out really good. I shot it the same way that I shot Eliminate. Eliminate was another dating show that I worked on. And so I, I used that same format and I got a green light from the Tennis Channel. But they said to me, look, at you, we can't like, air your show. You need to have a business entity. So you need to like be incorporated or something. So I went and hired a lawyer and became incorporated under the name Klein Creative Media. Because before I was just a stay-at-home mom and I had a little business, you know, a sole proprietorship called uh, Video Memories. But I ended up putting that away and, and, and incorporating with Klein Creative Media. And what happened was the tennis show did not end up, it, even though they said that, oh, yeah, we're, we're giving you a contract, they kept kind of stringing me along. And at first it was really hot and then it got warmer and warmer and, and then cold and then it went away. And so now I had spent all this money and I'm a corporation, but really I'm just a stay-at-home mom that had a creative idea. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I realized, okay, well, now I'm a corporation. I might as well do something with it. So I started dabbling in doing business videos and real estate videos. And through real estate videos, um, that was easier in my neighborhood to get involved with because um, I knew a couple of people who are realtors. And I said, hey, will you let me do a video for you for free? And if you like it, will you buy it from me? And so that's the way I was able to get, because no one wanted to really hire me as to do real estate videos because I didn't have any experience. They didn't care that I'm an Emmy-winning TV director. That's oh, it. wow. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> That's, That's how it. people are. That's crazy. Right? Isn't that funny? Oh, my and God. It, it's still that way. It's interesting. Um, I, I still find that interesting today. But, um, but so I did a couple of real estate videos on spec, and they were good, and they got bought. But I realized that the other people that were more successful in the real estate videos were flying drones. So I ordered a drone online, and... Um, I, I had a neighbor down the street who I knew that he flew a drone and he took me to the park and showed me how to, how to fly it, you know, the basics. Mm -hmm. And then I just practiced like a fiend and tried to figure out how this, the, the, the drone worked. Mm -hmm. And I actually became pretty good at it and started using drone. And then I learned that you can't use drone video in your production unless you're a commercial pilot. I mean, oh my I, God. I mean, for, you can't use it for commercial purposes unless you are a legal sports pilot or above. That's the word. So you had to be a legal sports pilot minimum. Wow. And, you, and you had to have this thing called a 333 exemption. And I'm scared of heights. And I'm thinking, like, <laughs> I'm thinking there's no way I'm going to be able to be a pilot. But my videos, everyone's loving these real estate videos with the drone. I have to, how can I figure <laughs> this out and do it legally? Because I can't, I'm not a lawbreaker. I'm a little bit of a rule breaker, but not a law breaker. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> so I decided to like, go for it anyways. And um, I, one of my best friends from high school, her current boyfriend was a flight instructor. And he, he's a sport pilot instructor. And he flies these things called light sport trikes. And it's basically like a hang glider attached to like a motorcycle, you know, like oh. a bucket kind of thing. Okay. <laughs> and... Um, so I went on, a, on a, an, an experimental flight with him, terrified, like scared to death. It was pretty cool to go up and, and you know, and conquer my fear but the first time. But then when I decided that, you know, I said, you know what, I'm going to sign up. Can, can you, because I need to become a pilot to do this legally. Can you get me there? And he said he could. And so I signed up and started taking courses and flying. And honestly, I was into 11 hours of classwork, of 11 hours in the air before wow. I got, before I ever stopped shaking with white knuckles <laughs> and started listening to what he had to say. Cause I really, I couldn't even hear a thing. Like I'm flying up there and I'm so scared and terrified that I can't even absorb the lesson that he's trying to teach me. But <laughs> eventually I figured it out. So after um, six months of training, I got a pilot certificate and, um, and I became a legal pilot and I got my 333 exemption. And now I was legal to fly drones in my video productions. So that sort of now that sort of differentiated me in the community. And I was able to, to market that as, Hey, do your real estate video with legal drone footage. Yeah. And I've seen some of your work with the drone and he's fantastic. So definitely you have a big differentiator there. Oh, thank you. And it's really fun. And I thought, you know, I live right by the beach, so it's really fun to fly over the ocean, which is my favorite place to be, you know, if not in it, soaring above it. 
So I'm, I'm pretty lucky. <laughs> Yeah, well, it sounds to me like you're, you know very well what, what you're passionate about. And as you say in your chapter, there's a, the says, if you think you cannot, you won't. If you think you can, you will. And that's a lot of wisdom there, right? So that uh, I think as I see and hear from you, it's like, uh, if you want to achieve something, it is, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of how I'm going to achieve it. And, and you get out of your comfort zone. If that's the price you have to pay, you pay it. <laughs> and, and so you're afraid of heights, yet you got your license. And that's something that it's a quality, I think, that the, it's what uh, helps you get wherever you want to go. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I think that is the factor for me. I don't know if it's for every entrepreneur, but for me, if something makes me have fear, that's when instead of running away from it, if I march towards that fear, I always seem to accomplish and overcome and grow. And that's when I seem to grow the most is when it's something that scares me. And sometimes I make some excuses for a while. Oh, I can't do this because of, the, and I make these little excuses, but it's really my fear. And until I stop making excuses and conquer that fear, I mean, that's when, I, that's when the, the growth happens and the change happens and success happens for me. No, wow, I think that's uh, hey, if if this was a video, I would say, and that's a wrap. That was such a <laughs> beautifully put. I mean, that's exactly uh, how I see it as well. And uh, the the ability to to just get out of the comfort zone and keep trying. And one of the things I did it with the podcast uh, initially. And well, I do it every in every interview, but initially it's like even the thought of me, a podcaster, it's impossible. And then you do the first one and you do the second one. It's like, okay, now <laughs> I think you're going to be f number 55 or something in terms of interviews. Wow. So, now you're a podcaster and you did it and you succeeded and look at, look at where you are now. Amazing. Yeah, well, it's a, it's at least it's at least you keep it going. I think that's the other advice that we've heard even from our co-authors is, you know, and you say it in your chapter too, if you fail, you stand up and and, and you made a very powerful comparison with uh with surfing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, surfing, you fall every single time that you go surfing. You fall and you get right back on that board and you go for it again. And that's the whole the whole idea of surfing. And that's it's exactly the same with entrepreneurship. You keep falling, you keep getting back up. Absolutely. And uh, so Marcy, what's next for you? What you are exciting about? What's giving you butterflies <laughs> besides the book, I guess, and the fact that we should be, we were going to be promoting heavily this book and we were excited about being able to hang out and now we have to do it virtually. I know. It's so sad. You and I were going to, we were going to hang out together in Nashville. We had this whole plan. I'm very disappointed that, that the country and the shut pink down. Shoes. Yeah, <laughs> and the pink shoes ready. <laughs> yes, we all think ever. I cannot wait to see all of us ladies together in a room in our pink shoes and then, you know, oh, holding our book. It's going to be, that moment is going to be with our arms around each other and not being worried about social distancing. That's going to be the best moment ever. <laughs> Exactly. I agree. And uh, so I know we're in the middle because we are obviously talking after this terrible pandemic hit us and we're still self-distancing. And so we're all finding creative ways to survive this. And, and the good thing is you and your business can do a lot of things remotely. Yeah. You know, I've kind of been rethinking, you know, my this is not necessarily my future goal, but my immediate shift is that I've started trying to figure out what people need right now? How can I help people right now through video? Because video is always something powerful that businesses need to promote themselves. But what, and since they can't come out to my studio or I can't bring my camera crew out to them, what can we do? And that's what I've been sort of pivoting with. And I've been, I've created some like online solutions like Zoom backgrounds and teaching people, coaching people through to look a certain way on camera. Because a, a lot of people are going in front of their cameras right now. They're in the spotlight on camera. And if they have the wrong angle, it's going to diminish their credibility. So I'm really wanting to help people right now and teach them how to appear on camera in a professional, in a professional light. And even like helping them with their lighting or helping them with their positioning and angling and their backgrounds. So that's kind of been my focus right now, immediate to help the people, you know, business people who are 
facing the coronavirus crisis. Well, there, there you go. There's something always uh, lucky that a, an a Emmy Award winner can help you. I know you helped me. I asked Marcy for help. Anybody that has seen the video with the family safer at home, she actually gave us some great shooting ideas that, that we implemented. So we were the lucky ones that got to tap into that brilliant brain of yours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. And it was really fun talking with you and your husband. It was really great. You guys are really creative too. Well, you know, I love it. Yeah, I guess this is the 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 point is uh, is we have to make what we can make in these conditions, and 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 you're really good at it, and in just being creative and reinventing ourselves as much as we can. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think um I think what I what I want to do for people right now is you know continue to help inspire them with ideas because. If you keep inspired and you keep, you know, keep positive and keep inspired, I think that can help go a long way, go a long way. Even if you're not like, you know, bringing in tons of money like your business normally would, you know, if you're inspired and you keep up the pace and you keep positive and look forward to the future, I think that's what, that's what will keep everybody going because we will get through this all to, and together, you know. Uh, that's a great message, Marcy. That's really powerful. And uh, I really want to thank you for being part of the podcast and sharing your thoughts and, and your journey, which has been fantastic. You're truly an inspiration that one can achieve anything that you set your mind to. Thanks. So so we'll be watching and I'll have all your information and your contact in, in, in the show notes. And uh, do you have any closing thoughts? Anything else? that you want to share before we say goodbye? Oh, I just want to say that I appreciate you and I love being a pink shoe sister and hopefully everybody enjoys the book. Yeah, and it's just I'm just so appreciative that you put me on your show. So thank you. I'm appreciative no. to know you. Thank you, Marcy. It's, it's been a great, great adventure so far. I look forward many more and uh, look up everybody at the link and get uh, Marcy's book, Women in Business Leading the Way. Thank you, everybody, until a new episode of Back to Basics. Bye-bye. Bye. And until the next time. Bye.